All right, we've covered the, um, the cranial nerves. And so now what we're going to jump into is a bit of a focused stroke exam. And you'll notice that it kind of covers the same stuff that we were talking about in the cranial nerves, plus a little bit more about the body. So uh, these are just a few more assessments to throw in as we're doing our systematic assessment. Um, and it gives us an idea of whether or not somebody might be having a stroke. Again, feel free to download the PowerPoint from paramedicine.com and uh, you can use these to learn just don't start charging for it because it's a non-commercial license. So I want to go a bit more into detail about this facial neural exam. So that's the W that we were looking at with our cranial nerves. And what I'd like you to do as we um, discuss this is to imagine a line drawn from the bottom of the eyes across the face. And that line at the bottom of the eyes is going to separate the top of our head from the bottom of our head. And we're going to do three specific assessments at the top above the eyes and three specific assessments below at the bottom of the eyes. Now, the reason we separate them like that is because of the way the nerves innervate our face, the way the nerves go into our face. In the top half of our face, we've got nerves coming in from both sides. So you've got nerves from both sides of the brain uh, innervating this side and this side, and nerves from this side of the brain innervating this side and this side. So there's redundancy. But at the bottom of the face, um, well, at the bottom of the face, it's unilateral innervation. So one um, lesion in that nerve will affect the face. We don't have that double, double wiring. We're double wired above the eyes. We're single wired below the eyes. Now, I actually go into this in a lot more detail. Um, I've got a, a, another lecture on YouTube. Um, it's hemiplegia or something like that. So if you want to take a look and go like dive deeper down this hole, then there's, I think, about a two-hour lecture on assessing hemiplegia. And I go into other things like Bell's palsy and differentials when you think it might be a stroke or but it might be something else. But here I want to keep it kind of simple and say we're doing our basic you know, bread and butter neuro exam that we do to anybody that with any sort of neuro red flag. So we're just going to throw in a few things to help um, comfort ourselves and make sure that they're not actually having a stroke. Okay, so what are we going to check? What are the three things we check above the eyes? Well, the first thing is forehead wrinkling, which we've already talked about. The next thing is the eye squeeze. We ask them to squeeze or you can ask them to push up against your fingers as we did when we were going up the middle with the facial nerve. The other thing we're going to look for is something called the palpable fissure, which I can't say very well, so I always call it the PF. The palpable fissure, or the PF, is the distance um, from the bottom of the eyelid to the top of the eyelid. It's how much of your eye you can see. So right now I've got a really wide PF, and right now I've got a very narrow PF. And what we look for is to see that the PF is the same on both sides. Now, very often when people teach stroke assessment, what they tell you to look for is something called ptosis. The P is silent. So ptosis is actually something different than the PF. Ptosis is when you have a, a sort of a, a droopy eye. The upper eyelid will droop and the lower eyelid will droop. And it doesn't necessarily, if I do this, it doesn't necessarily open my PF like that does. So what you're looking for is to make sure that the amount of eyeball that's showing underneath the top and the bottom eyelid is the same on both sides and that it's not, you know, abnormally large or abnormally small. Now, having said that, you know, someone with exophthalmos from thyroid problems, they, they've got, you know, the big buggy eyes and other people will have more closed eyes. Like it, there's a lot of variety in how much PF people normally have. So usually we just take a look to see that they're the same on both sides. So we look for the forehead wrinkling, we look for the palpebral fissure, and we do the eye squeeze test. Have them squeeze their eyes and have them push up against your fingers. So that's the top part of the head. Bottom part, where we said there's unilateral innervation, we're looking at three things. So smile and tongue protrusion, we've already done. The only other thing we're going to throw in there is to take a look at the nasolabial fold. Naso means nose, labia means lips. So the nasolabial fold is the fold that comes from the nose down to the lips. And in most people, these are bilaterally equivalent. They're the same on both sides. So if you see someone, you know, like this and like this, you know, 
All right. They've got a really wide PF. They can't do the eye squeeze. Uh, they've got a flattened nasal labial fold. You ask them to smile, and they kind of go. Rrr. So you're getting unilateral or bilateral differences, right? There's one side that's different than the other side. When you see those, you go, man, that looks like a stroke. So these are the clues that we're looking for. We should be able to for wrinkle our forehead equally. The PFs should be equal. There should be equal eye lid strength with the squeeze and the open. The nasal labial folds should be equal on both sides. They should be able to stick out their tongue normally, and they should be able to smile bilaterally equally. That's our quick exam for the face to see if they're having a stroke. And it becomes really important when we look at this later on when we're looking at which artery is probably having the lesion in a stroke. So that's the face, the head. Now we're going to take a look at the body exam. And what this woman is demonstrating is something called pronator drift. And it's a really important thing to look for. Historically, traditionally, we used to ask people to squeeze our fingers. So we'd put two fingers into their hands and say, squeeze my fingers as hard as you can. That's what I learned back in 1989 when I went through. Uh, we do finger squeeze. It's not very sensitive. People would squeeze my fingers and I'd go, I think they're the same, but you know, it's tough to tell unless one is grossly weak. So there's a much more sensitive test, and this is called pronator drift. And this essentially replaces the grip strength, the finger squeeze on either side. Here's what you ask the patient to do. You ask them to stick their arms out and put their palms up like they're holding a pizza box. That's the typical way. Can you put your hands up like you're holding a pizza box and just hold them there? That's the first step in this. And then you watch. This is called supination. That's pronation, that's supination. You're holding the soup cans, right? That's how we remember soup. So supination. And if they start to drift down and their hand starts to turn over, turning over into pronation, we call that pronator drift. And that's a sign of weakness on one side of the body. And you go, I don't think their brain's okay. I think maybe they're having a stroke because they're weak on one side of the body because they can't hold their hand up. They pronate or drift. So the first, I always do this in three steps. I always test pronator steps in three steps. The first is with their eyes open, holding up the pizza box. The next thing I do is I ask them to close their eyes and keep their hands there. And I wait about five or 10 seconds and say, just keep your hands up. I want to see if your hands are moving at all. I just want to see how well you can hold your hands up. That's the second stage. If they don't start to pronate or drift, they've passed second stage. Third stage is I tell them, I'm just going to tap the palm of your hands right now. I'd like you to keep your hands in the same position they're at. Don't let me push your hands out of position, okay? And I go, all right. And then you just push a little bit on one hand, push a little bit on the other hand. Normal would be like that. They get pushed, they get pushed, and it goes back into the same position. Again, they're doing this with their eye clo eyes closed. The patient's eyes are closed, not your eyes. If you push and they come back here, then that's kind of the same as pronator drift. They've lost their proprioception. They don't have the strength to come back into a normal position. So first thing we test, pronator drift, we test it in three stages. Hold the pizza box, hold the pizza box with your eyes closed, and now keep your hands holding the pizza box while I tap on each palm and let me see if they put their hands back to normal. And if they can do all three, then they've got equal body strength on both sides, and I'm happy because that's normal. If there's no pronator drift, I'm happy. So we can ask about the brain. We ask about vertigo, um, which we've spoken about already. We ask if their vision's okay, which we've done when we do the cranial nerves. We do the H test, already done. We ask if they're having any difficulty speaking. Remember, we ask them to speak. Well, that's dysarthria is difficulty in actually producing the words. So if they're having Speak. That's dysarthria. If they're having trouble with the language, then that's called dysphasia with an S. So uh, dysphasia would be something like, here's the classic. You hold up your pen and you say, can you tell me what this is? And then they go, mm, yeah. And you say, say, say the word for this object. What's the noun that describes it? And they can't actually produce it. 
they'll start to talk to you again and they'll say things like, I'm not feeling well. I'm, you know, I'm really worried. And there's no dysarthria. They're, they're uh, able to actually produce words properly. They're not Batman. They're speaking well. There's no dysarthria, but there's dysphasia. Either they, they, uh, they just can't produce the words. They can't recall the words. They're just, it's like, oh, what's the name for that? You know, uh, I'm dysphasic, man. So it's a fun, you know, little joke you can throw in when you're talking with your friends with medical training. Man, I just, I'm having a stroke. I'm dysphasic. I don't know. What's the word for that? You know, that's dysphasia. And then the last dis, there's the three disses, is dysphagia with a G, G for gulping, S for speaking, uh, and the T for articulating, being able to actually say the word. So dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. And remember, part of what we ask the people to do when we're doing our cranial nerve exam is to speak, to cough, and to swallow. So if they're having trouble with that, and then in your head you go, mm, brain's not okay. And you can look in your chart or recall from memory if you've reached that point of what the prob probable difficulty is. The other thing that we look for then is ataxia, which is just, you know, difficulty coordinating their movement. If they're having trouble, um, uh, you know, they reach for their bag and they're, they're you know, they've got this, um, uh, I forget what it's called, but uh, intentional motor, you know, dysfunction. Then those are things that we note as well. And we know where the ataxia is and we describe what it is. Because believe it or not, I've worked in hospitals, neurologists, cardiologists, the specialists will go back to the paramedic forms very often and see what the patient's initial presentation was like. When you're assessing a patient, you want to start at time zero. And time zero is when they hit the medical care stream, when they started being seen by healthcare professionals. And very often, the first healthcare professionals to see anybody are the paramedics. So we're time zero. We are the first trained observers. So put this information in. Put it in if it wasn't there. These are pertinent negatives for somebody who was having some sort of neuro insult that made us want to do our, our neurological assessment. And then the last one is limb hemiplegia, or sometimes called hemiparesis. Hemi means half. Uh, plegia or paresis means uh, weakness or inability to move it. So they've, that's, we do our pronate or drift test for that. And we also take a look at how they're moving. So sometimes we'll ask patients to move over to our stretcher. Sometimes we'll ask them to stand up and walk. We'll try to ambulate them if they seem like it's okay. And if we're worried at all, we'll stand on either side. Of course, we don't do that to chest pain or broken legs or anything like that. But if it's a straight neuro and we just want to see, we'll sometimes stand on both sides and we'll stand them up and we'll say, I just want to see if you're able to stand. Okay, and you know, we stay beside them just in case they start to stumble. And we say, take a few steps. How does that feel? So um, pronator drift is assessing the upper limbs and ambulation is assessing the lower limbs. We can check how that's working. Now I'm going to talk about two types of strokes. I'm going to talk about middle cerebral artery and posterior cerebral artery strokes because these are the most common presentation of strokes. Having said that, I don't want to fool you. They're the most common, but they are by far not the only way for strokes to present. Strokes can present as anything weird. People can be like, I just smell toast, and that could be a stroke. People could um, be anxious, and that's a stroke. People could be hallucinating, that's a stroke. Like there's all sorts of ways that strokes can present. But two of the most common are for there to be a lesion in the middle cerebral or the posterior cerebral artery. And here's what I mean. So we've got arteries that come up our neck and they go into basically a circle. There's a donut inside our head called the circle of Willis where arteries the, from both sides uh, connect. So carotid and basilar connect into the circle of Willis and then they exit from the circle of Willis into the rest of our brain. And fortunately, this is one area of anatomy where they made it simple because we've got Arteries at the front of the circle of Willis leaving called the anterior cerebral arteries. Thank you. We've got ones in the middle leaving the circle of Willis into the rest of the brain called the middle cerebral artery. And we've got some at the back leaving called the posterior cerebral artery. And again, if you look up the lecture on hemiplegia, I go into a lot more detail about um, the anatomy of the blood vessels. And I have these diagrams there as well. But what I want to show you is the typical presentation of the MCA-CVA or the MCA stroke. 
And this is what you'll see most often. So when we, it's about 70% of all ischemic strokes, and we see that there's we, the forehead is okay. So when we ask them to wrinkle up their forehead, it wrinkles bilaterally equally. So that's good. But when we go below the eyes and we look at the nasolabial fold and we ask them to smile and we ask them to stick out their tongue, they have problems doing that on one side of their face. So if you see a flattened nasolabial fold and they stick their tongue out, they can't do it very well. The stroke is on the other side of the head. It's the middle cerebral artery. So if it's the right side of their face in an MCA stroke that's presenting with hemiplegia, it'll be the right side of their body as well. Since the stroke's here, and this is on the other side, we call it contralateral presentation. So there's a little bit of description of what it looks like. Um, you'll have dysarthria, you'll have dysphagia as well, okay? Um, so dysarthria is the speaking, dysphagia is the gulping, the swallowing. This is a common presentation for stroke. All on the same side, but the top is clear. MCA stroke. The other stroke that we'll often see out in the field is the PCA or posterior cerebral artery stroke, which is, comes down into the pons. So sometimes it's called a pontine stroke. And you'll see that we have a contralateral, a crossed findings presentation, one side of the face and the other side of the body. So if it's a PCA stroke, you'll have uh, the facial deficits. So there's no forehead sparing. You get differences in the forehead. Palpable fissure is open on this side. Um, tongue, nasal labial fold, all the facial stuff is all on the same side. But the weakness in the body is on the other side. So sometimes when I'm talking to the class, I'll say, okay, what type of stroke is this? And they'll go MCA. And I'll go, right. What type of stroke is this? <laughs> and they'll say, that's a PCA, because it's the crossed findings. So that's a quick sort of um, down and dirty sort of uh, way to remember it. The simple way to remember it is that what happens most often is it's the same side of the face and the body. That's middle cerebral artery. That has forehead sparing, if you want to add on the cherry on top. Or you have crossed findings, and that's the posterior cerebral artery. Okay, the way that people will often remember this, the mnemonic that we teach the public is FAST. When you're having a stroke, think FAST and look for facial irregularities. So any of the things that we were talking about above and below the eyes, look for the arm irregularities. Are they able to hold their arms up? That's the A. And the S is speech. Are they able to speak properly? So if their face looks okay, if they can hold their arms up and their speech is okay, that's all normal. We're not as worried. We have to, you know, put that in the context of the entire clinical picture. But if everything is fine and they've got good face, arm, and speech, we're comforted. If they say they just seem to be, you know, acting a little funny and they've got facial weakness and they've got pronator drift, and they're not speaking properly, then we start to worry about a stroke and we activate our stroke protocol, okay? So that is, oh yeah, remember the bottom of the eyes there. That is an overview specifically of a quick, dirty, you know, tightly focused stroke assessment. Not hard to do. A lot of it is already covered in the, um, the 7W snap down the hole. So when we test the cranial nerves, we actually do a fair bit of that. Uh, we add a few things in, and we add that in anybody that is having any sort of neurological red flag just to comfort ourselves that they're probably not having a stroke. We can't rule a stroke in or out absolutely in the field. It's impossible. They need advanced imaging in the hospital. Um, but we can, we can get a pretty good idea if it looks like they're having a stroke. And if it looks like they're having one, even if it is Todd's paralysis or something else, then we're going to activate the stroke protocol and we're going to let them figure it out properly in the hospital. But certainly, you know, we don't leave these patients at home. So quick focused exam for a stroke. Hopefully that made a lot of sense. If you got any questions, leave them in the comments.